So I bought an OP1 and I'm a bit behind the curve with this one because Teenage Engineering first released the OP1 10 years ago in 2011 and whilst I like vintage gear this isn't really the kind of vintage gear that I usually go for because one it's still in production and it's still on sale brand new and two it's pretty bloody expensive. To be honest I have never really been all that interested in the OP1 before. I didn't really like the design of it. I didn't really understand why people liked it. And to me, it just seemed kind of like a toy digital synthesizer. And I didn't know why you would spend the money on that when you could get so many other devices that did so much more. The reason I kind of changed my mind on the OP1 and started sniffing about it was because I think like many other people I've found over the past few months or maybe even you know the past year that even though I want to do something creative and make music I can't always be bothered thinking too much about what kind of arrangement I'm going to have to make and going through the whole process of coming into the studio which isn't really that huge a uh, task since it's just next door but sometimes I just want a low barrier to entry to make music and feel productive about things and the OP1 kind of ticks the boxes for that because if you look around even now there aren't a huge amount of portable battery operated devices with the kind of features that the OP1 has. The closest thing I can think of is the MPC Live which has the battery and the speaker but it's still quite a chunky unit and so it's not really as portable or as couch friendly as the OP1 is and so I guess in some ways that's why the device has been so popular over the past 10 years and remains popular to this day. Obviously I decided to take the plunge and got one for myself and part of the reason that pushed me over the edge in the end was that it wasn't just that it was battery powered and portable and all the rest of it but that there was a kind of alternative approach to making music with it where it had some interesting sequencers in there and I'm a sucker for interesting sequencers because I think if you change your workflow you change the way you approach making music and you can get much more interesting results but along with that at the core of the OP1 is quite a different philosophy to approaching how you make music and that's what I wanted to kind of explain a wee bit in this video because it was something that I didn't really ever glean even from watching other people's videos it just didn't connect the dots inside my head for whatever reason so that's what I'm going to explain why I like it and why I think it's probably worth it in 2021 for that feature alone if that's something you're interested in. I should say there's loads of things to go through in the OP1 and I'm not going to go through every feature. Um, I'll do that maybe in another video or explain the individual features but in this I just want to explain the kind of things that I think are interesting and what make the OP1 unique even 10 years down the line and at its price point. So this is the OP1 and I'm sure you've probably seen one of these before but I've zoomed in on it specifically so I can talk to you about a few particular features that I think are especially interesting and which even in 2021 are quite unique. The first thing to talk about in relation to the OP1 and how it fits in in 2021 is arguably the thing that makes it most unique out of any other music technology that's available at the moment. And ironically, this is something that I didn't even appreciate until I got one of them in my hands. I'd seen it in reviews and demos and stuff like that, but I didn't quite understand how deeply it mattered to the way you approach making music with the OP1. Specifically, I'm talking about the fact that at the heart of the OP1 is this philosophy where it's based around the idea of a four track tape recorder. Now, I'm sure you're probably sitting there going, big deal, all DAWs are based on multi-track tape recorders. And yes, that is true. But with the OP1, this approach manifests itself in a completely different way to what you may expect from any other digital multi-track recorder. Yes, you have four tracks, but that limitation isn't really the main difference. The main difference for me here is that unlike on a DAW, where you're used to being able to see the waveform or you know MIDI notes or you would deal with clips or loops in a certain way, on the OP1, you literally just get an indicator of 
what chunks of tape you've recorded onto. So if we go on to track four here, you can see that I've recorded a bunch of different things and there's really no indication what's on there at all. I can't name them. I can't see what notes are there. All I can see is that that was one big long session. It bases each recording on each session you've done and that's the only visual indicator you get of what's on the tape. Now you can of course record loops and actually one of the key things in the OP1 is setting up loop points. So you have you could set up like a four bar or eight bar loop and then record that but you still don't get the visual indicator like you would in a DAW as to what's on there and rather than having each track dedicated to a specific instrument although you can do that what you really have to do within the limitations is overdub on top of what you've already done. So you might have two or three synth parts on a single track and that, you know, that's fine, that's not that big a deal, but the whole workflow around how you move things and copy, because you can't really copy, you can only cut them, is all based on this concept of using an actual tape. So if you want to cut or you want to copy one chunk, you have to cut it up first, just like you would with a tape. And then you have to lift it out, like again, you would with a tape, and it takes it off the timeline. And so then you have to splice it into whatever part of the song that you, or track that you want it to live on. You kind of have to get much more creative in how you arrange things, and it does make a difference. The other notable thing linked to the tape, actually, is that there's famously no undo button and so you need to be really careful about what you're recording and what track you're on and whether or not you've kind of taken a wee backup copy of your chunk of tape somewhere uh, because if you overdub on top of something you can't just fix it. If you've only got one copy and you mess up a note then that's it, you're kind of stuffed. In some ways that's quite a commitment to the concept of recording onto this virtual tape. But in other ways, it seems kind of stupid because really you can still work around it by taking multiple copies of say one section and then only recording over the first and then, you know, keeping the second as a backup if you mess up. So people already are effectively finding ways to get around the undo limitation, which kind of takes you away from the whole concept of using the tape in the first place, but uh, you know, I guess I'm not too sad about there being no undo button, let's put it that way. The commitment to the whole idea of this being a single tape is also represented in the transport mechanism. So you literally rewind or fast forward and that's how you get around the recording. But the, it all adds to that you know, approach that you're not just doing something in another digital box. There are some other considerations when you're recording this thing as well. For example, if you overload any single track, you start to get distortion and it kind of blows things out and everything muddies up. And that is something you would have to take into account if you're recording on a four track cassette recorder. And so you do have to think much more carefully about your arrangements and compositions, which is a nice departure actually, because it's a different set of challenges to what you can get within, you know, your standard DAW. Aside from the kind of whole thing about limitations though, there are some cool ways you can make use of the tape, you know, philosophy, and that is by recording the sounds of the tape back into itself. So you can basically, you get all of that kind of interesting rewind, fast forward sounds, and even the kind of tape stop sound like it just gives you a whole bit more of a performative element to things that you wouldn't get within a DAW without using a specific plugin. What I don't love about this is that even though there's one tape in here, the tape is limited to six minutes which is you know fine and there are ways you can kind of deal with that but in order to save your tape or save what's on the tape you have to connect it to your computer. So if you're traveling or something like that without a computer, this isn't really ideal because there's no way for you to save the contents of your projects or your tape and then start working on some completely new. And I think you could have stuck within the whole kind of tape approach to this device 
uh, but had a way to load up multiple tapes. I don't really think that would have been, you know, betraying the core concept too much and would have given way more flexibility. So that is one of the things that you might want to be aware of. On that point, actually, this is another thing which I do like about the OP1, and that is the fact that you can export the individual tracks. So if you connect up your computer to the OP1, rather than having to bounce stems down or anything like that, the four tracks of the tape are always available as individual audio files. So you can just finish whatever you're working on, connect up your laptop, drag off the individual tracks and stick them straight into a DAW for processing. And that is something that is superb because it gives it way much more flexibility even if you're limited to the six minutes of the total length of the tape. When you consider this device was from 2011 as well, the fact that that was included is amazing because there's so many devices you get nowadays that don't have that capability, so thumbs up. Aside from the tape thing though, there are a few other specific things to mention which I think are pretty cool. You have different synthesis engines within the OP1, but you're not limited to the different presets that Teenage Engineering have included. So on the left, you have your different kinds of synthesis engines, but on the right here, you also have a bunch of different presets. And if you go online to a website called op1fun.com, there are a whole host of different patches that have been uploaded by the community. So if you can find a specific sound you want, or you can generate a specific sound within the OP1, you can simply go on, find someone else who's created one and then download it and put it on your device. This, I think, is a great addition or a great feature. Whilst it might not be the most unique feature, it is a great feature because if you're spending a significant amount of money on a device like this, then you want to be able to have some level of customization and that kind of ticks that box for me. So that's another thumbs up. The next major thing though to speak about is the interface and the way you interact with the OP1. So if you look here, you've got the colored knobs, which are kind of infamous now or famous, I guess I should say. Everyone kind of recognizes those knobs, but they aren't just there to be, you know, kind of look nice. They actually have a practical function. And that is that whatever parameter you're editing on the screen will be directly linked to the color of the knob. So for example, here, the synth engines are in blue and you use the blue knob to adjust them and the presets are selectable with a green knob because they are in green. And that approach carries through every single feature on the OP1. So whenever you see a blue colored section of the screen, you can usually control it or almost always control it with a blue knob, etc. And that makes it really intuitive and easy to use even for people who are using it for the first time. This is something that is especially important actually when you consider the fact that a lot of the different features on here are designed without the standard kind of labels and stuff you might expect. So each synthesis engine, for example, has a different image which reacts differently to the parameters that you change. So let's say we go into pulse here you can see that the design or the graphic on the screen changes with whatever you know you're shaping and that's great and gives you a really nice um, kind of connection between the sound and between what you're seeing on screen which is something I really appreciate but the thing about it is there aren't labels in the traditional sense so there's no real explanation on the screen outside of the visualization as to what parameters you're changing so having the color coded uh, correlation between the controls and the actual parameters itself is really important. Now, I actually quite like the fact that there isn't a lot of textual explanation of what each thing is because in many ways, I find that a lot of music software can be quite intimidating or quite serious. And if you're doing something creative, then there's nothing worse than loading up some software and being like, oh, I don't understand any of this and feeling like you have to learn a whole bunch of technical jargon before you can just start making music. And with this, you don't have to. It really relies on you playing around, seeing the visual representation, associating it with what you can hear and then finding something that you like and that's it. So I think it's a really intuitive and easy 
uh, thing to use and it's one of its greatest strengths. I think that more um, synth designers need to take a page out of Teenage Engineering's book, at least with regards to the attention to detail and usability of the OP1. The alternative approach runs right through the device and so if you load up effects you have a whole bunch of weird effects like the infamous cow which you'll no doubt have seen somewhere online it's one of my favorites there's also a weird telephone here which who knows what that actually does but there's also even when you have kind of standard effects like the delay it still, it changes the way you interact with it because of the graphical display and the way things are laid out and explained, which is something I really like because you end up getting different sounds than you might normally. For example, if you're used to always dialing in a specific type of delay based on feedback or distance or whatever, you can't do that here. So you, you just have to rely on what you can hear. And I like that a lot. Related to this, another feature of the OP1 which I really liked and something which drew me to it was the sequencers. And within the sequencers, depending on which page you're in or which uh, engine, whether it's the drum engine or the synth engine or whatever, there are different kinds of sequencers. And they range from stuff which is quite, you know, straightforward like an arpeggiator or, you know, I don't know, a step sequencer with a different graphical interface to something like this, the tombola, where you can drop lots of different notes in here and you, by changing the gravity and the shape of the tombola, you change how the notes are triggered and when and that's something which reminds me actually in many ways of the monome and the approach to alternative melody composition within devices like that because it helps you think about things differently or have happy interesting accidents by finding combinations of melodies or notes or sounds that you wouldn't normally get and this for me is a big deal because I often can kind of just get stuck when I'm looking at a keyboard and be like well I don't know what to do now but with this you have a whole bunch of different possibilities even with something like the monkeys, which is the drum sequencer, where basically you write out your sequence at the top and then the monkeys play it down below, even just that simple act of having the graphical representation of that makes quite a big difference. And so this was something that I really liked about the OP1 and something which I still continue to like about it. I wish there was a way to add more uh, alternative sequencers in here, but unfortunately, I think we're stuck with the ones they have. But the selection is good as it is. The key though is that there are lots of interesting and alternative workflows within this device and that's actually what makes it interesting and that's the thing I never really understood in the first place was that this is more actually than just a wee toy synthesizer and arranger. It lets you think about the way you approach things quite differently and that's its key strength. Maybe you're the type of person who doesn't like any of this and thinks it's all just faff and that you just need stronger features and better synthesis engines and greater modulation and all the rest of it. And if so, that's completely understandable. But for me, I think that having an alternative interface actually makes a huge difference to the inspiration you have, but also the music you eventually make. And so for me, the OP1 still has a lot to offer in 2021, even just because of its alternative approach to produce some music and putting tracks together. And if you're someone who's always interested in finding different ways to approach your music making, then I would definitely say that it's worth taking a look at. Because like I said, I dismissed it originally and then realized that I'd kind of misunderstood what it was actually about. Even if you love the OP1, there's no getting away from the fact that it's not an inexpensive device. And for me, the biggest question really is, after 10 years and at the price point that it's at, is the high cost worth it? And I think the answer to that for me is 100% definitely not, but maybe. The reason I say that is because whilst on one hand, I mean, I paid for this device, I paid for it full price, and I was reluctant to go second hand because of the high cost, Plenty of other people do the same thing. They are all out there buying the OP1 right now as we speak. So it must be worth it to some degree if people are actually willing to spend that kind of money on it. But on the other hand, 
it just doesn't really feel like it's worth that amount of money. The features that you, you get in it, when you compare them to other devices that are kicking about now, like the MPC-1 or the Akai Force, they, they just blow the OP-1 out of the water in almost every way. And whilst, yes, Teenage Engineering are a boutique company and Akai are much bigger, it's hard not to make that kind of calculation when you're thinking about money you're spending on something like this. There are of course lots of people who say things like, well, you know, the quality of the build in the OP-1 is superb, the design is brilliant, it's made, you know, from salvaged metal that used to be on Concord or whatever else. But if you look at Teenage Engineering and their kind of way they've developed as a company over the past few years, you begin to question whether or not it's really worth the premium price for the quality of the build and the features that are in there, or whether you're actually just paying a premium because it's a teenage engineering product. And I think that kind of premium pricing becomes more evident when you look at their site where they are celebrating the 10th anniversary of the OP-1 and they're selling a jumper with the OP-1 anniversary logo on it for the pricely sum of 100 Great British Pounds which, you know, for me, there's no jumper on earth that should cost 100 pounds if it just looks like a Fruit of the Loom sweatshirt even if the Pope himself had sewn it together it shouldn't be costing £100. So I do get the feeling maybe we've been conned a wee bit. What I will say is that I like the OP-1 and even though I paid full price for it and I don't think it was, you know, really worth that kind of money, I'm not sending it back. And I do like that it changes the way I uh, approach making music. The answer to the question about whether or not it's worth it in 2021 to get one of these really is, well, what do you want to use it for? If you want to use it for the portability, the battery, and the kind of amount of features you get alongside that, then yeah, of course, it's completely worth it. But if you're looking at it as a kind of DAW replacement, because I've seen people describe it as a DAW, and yes, whilst that may be technically correct by some barometer, if you're looking for a DAW replacement, you're not gonna find it here. You'd be much better off going with something like the Akai MPC-1, or the even the Akai Force, which is way more fully featured and less expensive than the OP-1. With all of that said, I've only had the OP-1 for a few weeks, so whatever I think about it now might make sense and might resonate with somebody who's looking to get one, but at the same time, I could very well change my mind in a few months after using it heavily, or maybe not using it all that heavily, and I guess only time will tell. In the meantime, there are a bunch of tips and things that I've picked up from using it that may be interesting, and so I'll probably be doing a bunch more videos on the OP-1 as time goes on, partly to justify the cost of the thing in the first place. So if there's anything you're interested about specifically, you can tell me and I will perhaps one day answer it. For now, thanks for watching, and if you are going to buy an OP-1 after watching this video, then I'm going to leave an affiliate link down below because if you're going to spend a thousand pounds on this synthesizer you may as well click the link and let me get 10 pence or something from the sale so cheers in advance